Cool. Well, here we are with uh, Kevin Caveman Shirley at his place. That uh, what do you call your place anyway? The cave. The cave, appropriately enough. Yeah. <laughs> cool. You're up here in Malibu, and uh, yeah, in the yeah. sticks. Beautiful Malibu. Yeah. It's, you know, once you get here, it's worth the drive. <laughs> and worth staying. Yeah. I never wanted to live in Los Angeles. Yeah. And so I, st I stopped in Malibu, and uh, I got a session here. And so I did one session here in Malibu on my way to Australia. I was, um, I, I, you know, I was going to move to Australia. And I thought, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so I stopped here, <laughs> and here it, I am it, in Malibu. That's a good place to stop, yeah. definitely. So, yeah, while we're talking about your journey to the States, uh, originally you're from South Africa. Yep. And so how, yeah, if you can just give a kind of an outline. Of Long your, and tarried road. Yeah. Just, uh, uh, I, was in South, uh, I was in South Africa most of my, uh, all my growing up. Mm -hmm. I started working in the studio there when I was about 20. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to Australia when I was 26. Oh, wow. Um, That's a big move. Yeah, it was a big yeah. move. My family all moved when I was just in my 20s. Um, mm -hmm. The Australians didn't let me in. Oh, wow. So I was the I was kind of left behind um, to fend for myself, and my younger brother escaped the South African Defence Force. There was mandatory uh, military service then, oh, wow. and we were we were you know we that was the height of the apartheid era, and we were uh, you know very opposed to it. And he stood up for um, <laughs> basic human rights and got crap beaten out of him. Jeez. And so my dad took him, and they fled to Australia and. And I followed. They, they, the Australians wouldn't let me in, and then they finally let me in. And when I was 26, once I had a few gold records under my yeah, belt. Yeah, there you go. That's so, uh, that's that's an interesting beginning. And so, yeah. and how long were you in Australia? And then I was in Australia for uh, I was in Australia for a while, mm. um, and then I found a band there called the Baby Animals, mm. and then we did a first our first record in uh, their first record in the states with uh, Mike Chapman in New York, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, Mike invited me back to do a few more projects with him, and then I got, ended up doing more and more projects, and um, until until I finally run out of work and money, and I was raising a, a single di parent raising a kid, and so um, when I was in the depths of my um, despair and poverty, I got a gig with Rush, oh, wow. doing the Counterparts album, and uh, that I mean it's just a very strange story because. I went up to see the guys in Rush. Mm -hmm. um, and was that in New York? or That was in Toronto. Toronto. We were living in New York at the time, mm -hmm. and I was living in a residential hotel. We hadn't paid rent for a year. Oh, wow. And so I went up, uh, the guys from Rush, I finally, like, I couldn't get any arrested. I, I mean, I worked on Bon Jovi and Billy Squire and all sorts of things, and I just couldn't get arrested up there. So um, uh, I uh, went up and had a meeting with Rush um, about doing the Counterparts album. And um, uh, it was a good meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, they said, what do you do? What do you like? What, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, this is what I do. And then and I went back. I was, and I, it was only going to be a lunch meeting. Mm -hmm. And I got back, and they wouldn't let me into the United States. Oh, my God. And I had a son, and I was a single parent, and I had a son with a nanny in Manhattan. And... They wouldn't let me back in, and I, you know I didn't have any money or anything. I was like, "What am I going to do?" So I called the guys from Rush, and I said, "Hi, <laughs> I've just been to see you, and yeah. I've just been for the interview, yeah. and I know the album's not starting for uh, two months or so, yeah. but I need to know. Do you want to employ me?" And they go, "Well, we'll let you know." I said, "Well, here's the deal. I need to know today. <laughs> I need to know now." Wow. And they said, "Well, I said I'm stuck at the airport. I'm either going to go back to Australia." or else I'll stick around if you want me to do the job. They said, well, let me go and talk to the guys, and we'll be back with you, and call, call us back in 30 minutes. I called them, and they said, all right, we've uh, decided that we're going to hire you to do the album. Well, that must have been an interesting half an hour away, sir. And, well, it wasn't quite <laughs> over then. And then I said to them, well, if you want me to stay, yeah. I'm going to need a couple thousand dollars cash in the morning because yeah. I need a place to stay. And they was like, okay. <laughs> And the next morning, Peggy, the you know, the one of the managers from Rush, came over and she brought me a bundle of notes. That is a crazy and I was story. Rented a place and we were there for a month in the snow before. They, I mean, they didn't have even have studios yet. 
So by the time I'd finished it, it, long story cut to, by the time I finished Rush, I decided life was much better as a big fish in a small pond. I was going back to Australia. I was going to take my bat and ball, go back to Australia. And I went back to Australia, got a great apartment right on the beach. It was beautiful. It only cost $1,000 a month. I was doing like the little local Aussie bands, discovered Silverchair, made the Silverchair record, sold 5 million records. <laughs> And then everyone in the states wanted me. To <laughs> That's funny. So, I, and so for years, I left and I, I left my place in the state. I kept my place in the st in Australia, mm -hmm. and then I came t to the states and I, uh, um, I worked in Los Angeles. And, I, and then I did. Uh, then I went and had a meeting with the guys from Journey mm -hmm. in San Francisco. I'd never heard of them before. If you can actually believe that, I mean, I was not a fan. And Journey were pretty much, you know, um, an American. Mm -hmm. band and they really didn't break out of the states much That's interesting. so I didn't know them at all so I went and had this meeting and I was not you know in awe of them at all mm -hmm. I just didn't know I didn't know them I didn't know <laughs> faithfully and 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 all the songs and wow. and so Steve Perry tried to rattle me and I wasn't going to get rattled and I think he liked that and mm -hmm. and they they hired me at, the, at first meeting uh, ignorance can be helpful at times yeah <laughs> so that was journey and then I did Aerosmith and then I was in the states and basically, I settled in the States at that point, spent some time in London with doing Led Zeppelin and that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and um, then I came back and moved to L.A. So uh, just uh, Chapman, how did you hook up with him originally? Well, I had produced the baby animals, mm -hmm. uh, all the demos. for mm -hmm. the And I was working with them, and, and I think I was doing some live sound for them maybe at the time as well. This would be uh, late 80s in, in Australia. Mm -hmm. And they were signed by Terry Ellis, mm -hmm. who uh, are formerly of Chrysalis Records. Exactly. And um, and Terry had formed a new label called Imago, mm -hmm. based in New York. And they were one of his first signings. And Terry had had great success with Mike back in the Blondie days mm -hmm. and, and all that stuff. And so Terry had hired Mike to produce the record. Gotcha. And Mike said, I like the sound of the demos. Mm -hmm. Bring the engineer you're using yeah, anyway. Nice. So... And, you know, and how was it working with him? Because I've heard, you know, that he was an Mike? interesting, yeah. Mike's guy. interesting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's a, he's a, Mike's a interesting character. He doesn't talk to me now, and I have no idea why. Oh, wow. But uh, I, he, he he thinks I sold out by working with, uh, you know, bands like Aerosmith and... and That's crazy. Yeah, but... And I mean, as far as from a production experience, was he, you know, helpful, do you think? Yeah, he was yeah. helpful. Because, you know, I grew up with the notion of uh, multi-track recording as, well, when t to begin with, my first history of multi-track recording was in Cape Town, South Africa, with a guy called uh, Tali McCulley, who built his own tape machines. And we couldn't track all the tracks at the same time. So we would track, I think we could track a few tracks, three or four, or maybe six or eight tracks of the, of the 24 track at the same time. But uh, he was the kind of guy who did jingles, and he'd play the kick drum with his fingers, and he'd play the snare drum, and then he'd do the hi-hat, and then he'd do the tom fills. Wow. And he'd play, that's how he'd play a drum kit. And we used to monitor everything out of the left side of the console and record out of the right, and it was one of those things. So I, I grew up with this concept of, of, of multi-track recording, a lot like people from the 80s had, mm -hmm. but you know, only because of necessity. And that was, we're going to get the drums right first, and the bass drum, and then the guitar, and then the vocal. Yeah. And a lot of people still work like that. Mm -hmm. From Mike, I learned about capturing performances in a live situation. Yeah, yeah, and he was great. He would get everyone in, he'd pour everyone vodka, and say, fuck you, go and play. <laughs> and that was Mike's <laughs> attitude. And, and he, Mike had such a thing. I mean, I saw him, he had a way of unsettling people when they needed to be unsettled and making them comfortable when they needed to be, you know, comfortable I saw him once with the with the, the the girl from the baby animals, and she was getting really full of him of, of of herself. And so he sent her out to do a vocal overdub. And so she went. She stood in the booth, and then he turned down the volume and he just talked and talked and talked. And he, and then every time she was going to come out of the thing, he'd go, "Okay, no, no, we, we need you in there." And, and then he'd just keep her in there, and he just wow. rattled her. Wow. And then you know, an hour later, he got her to sing something, and she was. You know, furious, and she really gave the performance that he was looking for. So he had ways of, 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 of 
of psychologically disturbing people <laughs> enough to create what he needed. <laughs> That's but it was a big lesson, you yeah. know, and, and I've learned that, and especially in rock when you're looking for attitude or you're mm -hmm. looking for a particular kind of feeling. You can go from everything, you know, you can go from you know, sending the band out to get a tequila that to, or, you know, you do whatever you can to create the, the vibe yeah, that you need. Exactly. So. so then you stayed in New York for a while? Yeah, I stayed in New York until, until I moved. Till, well, I'd spent a year in London mm -hmm. doing Led Zeppelin and Iron Maiden. Mm. Then I moved That's, back. That was worth the trip. Yeah, <laughs> it was. I mean, the project wasn't meant to take that long, but they yeah. didn't really know what they had. I mean, with the Led Zeppelin thing, you know, the manager came to me and said, we have a treasure trove mm -hmm. of, of wealth, really, with all this live Led Zeppelin stuff. And by the time we started looking at it, it, like, it really wasn't that much. There was some really shaky performances and there was a lot of drug use going on in the band mm. and in the 70s and so there were performances that weren't good at all and there was, was some that the how the west was won how the west was won and, yeah. the, and the dvd there was a lot of uh compromised stuff shall we mm. say so what looked like being and we didn't know what we were going to do basically i went uh, you know I, I got to the studio and it was like well there's a room full of old tapes going back from 1968 mm -hmm. to 1980 and we're going to do something with them. And it was like, you know, well, what are we going to do with them? And, our, you know, Jimmy Page at that point was like, well, I want to be in New Orleans in, in eight weeks' time to see my uh, son. Mm. So we need to do something in eight weeks. And I looked at them and I opened up the first tape, which was like 1968 recording of the, the Royal Albert Hall. And the tape was falling apart. I said, oh, we, we got to bake these tapes. And he was furious. He was like... Why do you have to bake the tape? And I'm like, well, <laughs> there's oxide and tape and glue, and it's coming off and storing in moldy old England. It'll do that it's to physics. you. And he was, yeah. yeah. And he was livid. And we finally had to bake the stuff, and we had to bake everything and transfer everything. So that t alone took us about three or four weeks to get done. Exactly. So, you know, we started off on the on the wrong foot, and so that, that eight weeks never worked. And then mm -hmm. it just kept going, well, what are we going to do? We got you know thirteen versions of Dazed and Confused, and each at you know twenty seven minutes long. Let's listen to the whole lot once. So, you know, that's gonna take us, Hello, you know, yeah. just in time a few days, and we transfer everything and then listen back to it because mm. we have to transfer everything to multi track. That is also five point one. Yeah, it is five point one. Both of them are five point one. Mm. How the West was one was five point one, and the DVD, which are. Yeah. A lot of people think they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're entirely different things. Exactly. There's different material on how the West was one and on the DVD. And yeah, they're both 5-1. Yeah, and I see your setup for 5-1 in here too. Which I is am. Unusual for any studio, especially your own personal studio. Well, I'm set up for 5-1 and everything is locked in. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. we, um, all the speakers are locked into the ground and mm -hmm. locked into place. And it's also set up with a little more... Um, Simpatico for a home system in that, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've looked at thousands, uh, a, a thousand people's different home setups, and 80% mm -hmm. of them are the little Bose satellite speakers in the corners in the sub. Mm -hmm. So I have my rears raised like the Bose's, and I have my center poking right at, mm -hmm. right down your throat, mm -hmm. like m that little Bose one does when it, you're it, watching movies. Exactly. And, and I'm basically set up for. One of the things I'm always confused is why there is a difference between Audio 5.1 mm -hmm. and Video 5.1. Yeah. I mean, is that stupid or what? Yeah, yeah. And most anyone, most everyone that uses 5.1 uses it to watch movies with. So I have mine set up in that configuration. Yeah, the home theater yeah. or scenario. Any moron that sits at home and listens to 5.1 in a perfect environment <laughs> deserves what he gets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's cool though, but uh, and then I like helicopters go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.